Hi, hi, Gayatri. Good, good afternoon. Hey, Kiran. Good afternoon. Uh, hailing from Bombay. What about you in Bangalore? Yes. Um. Yeah, Bangalore. All good. I. I don't think I've seen much of Bangalore in the last five months. So I yeah. could be anywhere. <laughs> right. I mean, COVID has made it that way that like people can work from anywhere. And how is that remote work environment uh, working for you guys? Um. I think we are. I think we have passed the stage of oh my god this is not going to work to a point where um, you know we we still live in a bit of a blur between um, work and 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 home um, and uh, uh, but I I guess there are some positives on the non travel to the point that I heard people even miss the travel especially the Bangalore traffic I heard in one of my team meetings somebody said. I wish we could go in a cab, and I was like, "That is not a wish that <laughs> you should have." Um, but you know, uh, jokes aside, I guess um, uh, remote management is definitely a um, test in leadership, um, especially when you're inheriting new teams or you're, you know, making changes. It's it's a hard one, um, I guess, all, all through. And the second is my heart goes out to all the new college graduates who've joined this year. Um, uh, it's my view that, you know, I can always raise my hand and say, you know, some of the best code I wrote as, as a new joinee was, or even later is ones that I copied, right? I think there's no such thing as originality and you don't have that connect as a, is, you know, sets them back. So I constantly try to keep in touch to say, you know, it's not you that who doesn't know, it's just that everybody doesn't know and we're just stronger collectively. And it's hard to do it new, um, especially when you're new, just out of college and need that help. So, I, I love these points because uh, two things. Uh, first is to introduce the audience to who you are. So everyone, this is Gayatri. Gayatri works with Intuit and she's the director of engineering. And she's been in uh, working with technologies, I think, for a good decade and a half, although she looks quite young for <laughs> the experience. Where did you start coding? No, it's uh, it's uh, more than two decades actually. So, two decades. Um, uh, so I actually joke saying that when I had five years experience, I would have said five years and two months. And right. now that I have well over twenty years, I say well over twenty years than the actual specific date. Wow. Um, but I I started um, coding when there was uh, when Java was just born. So that's old, <laughs> how old I am. Um, and uh, and and I have. Um, uh, my own journey has, uh, and, and, and yes, I, I right now, what I do is I um, uh, director of development for um, identity platforms within Intuit uh, India. Um, maybe I can quickly introduce Intuit in that context. Uh, I, I you know Intuit is, I think uh, most of you would know it as um, a TurboTax or QuickBooks uh, products, which essentially we cater for small business, self-employed, and um, you know people like you and me who pay taxes. Unfortunately, TurboTax is in the US, but the rest of the products are worldwide. Um, we, uh, you know, the mission statement we have is, you know, powering prosperity around the world. So that's essentially what we try to do, root for the, for the, for the, uh, for those who want to dream and do things for themselves. Um, and uh, my role is, uh, I am um, uh, in product development. I lead uh, identity uh, out of India. And uh, uh, so essentially all the cross-cutting capabilities of uh, authorization, sign-on, sing, uh, you know, uh, single sign-on and stuff like that, which is uh, stuff that you see behind the scenes that happens magically is all the stuff that happens out of uh, my team. Um, and uh, about my own journey is, uh, uh, you know, I, I have uh, my foundations in pretty much you, uh, started with uh, security. Um, I did a lot of uh, identity and access management for financial industry for the first, I think probably 12, 12 years of my life. Um, and then I switched to, um, uh, you know, working on uh, APIs and frameworks um, as a core platform development for mostly, you know, um, enterprise apl applications. Um, and I tenured with uh, SAP um, during that uh, uh, period. Um, and now my focus is, uh, you know, continues to be in application foundations in Intuit. I, I think there is definitely a pattern there. Um, you know, the, the stuff that I try to build or do is stuff that I can never explain to my family. Um, but however, you know, what brings me joy is that, um, how do you build the right tech? Um, 
and and simple and robust solutions. So I think that's that's been my passion. Let's pause here for a moment. I feel being a non techie, it's a bit overwhelming. I'm going to lay it out uh, as a layman what I heard you say. So you yes. mentioned that you were working with uh, enterprise based solutions. Identity is basically my identity when I join with uh, regards to my financial transactions that happen. And how that's tech enabled is someone, you're one of the people on the back end who's actually led this product to be. Uh, discovered very great uh, so uh, i would i would love for us to take a bit of latitude on our topic today which is platforms and apis and today's uh, session is about raising insights uh, from someone who is on uh, on like leading the tech backbone of one of the larger uh, mncs that uh, have come out of this country so help me uh, gather uh, insights how do an entrepreneur, how does an entrepreneur leverage uh, tech? When does an entrepreneur approach and especially the mindset and the word platform? I think we should start with the very basics. What's the platform and how do we, um, how does an entrepreneur leverage these platforms? What's your advantage on this? Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good place to start. And, um, and I, I would love to keep this more uh, relatable to everybody so that it's not going to be um, in a tech jargon, but mostly derives from uh, the experiences that I've had. Um, so some of these might be opinions. So, you know, just um, you know, go with that. Um, so when do you actually start? Um, I, I think we start, in, in this day and age, I think we start using platforms the moment you sign up for an Amazon account uh, on AWS, right? Most of us don't run our own data centers. Most of us, most of the entrepreneurs themselves don't run data centers, they use compute. Um, but, uh, you know, just to uh, slice that question, um, you know, what is a platform, right? I think a platform is, is nothing but a group of technologies that which other applications or other uh, products are developed on, right? So the short answer is that it depends on your business model. So if you're an entrepreneur um, whose business product itself is a platform, and, and give me an example that, give me an example is you're building an Uber, you're building um, a, a marketplace uh, where it's purely people come in to exchange value, um, then you are you're going to start by thinking about platform because your your day one is is to figure out how do you create a platform for others so you're going to start thinking about foundation about what is the best way to people to come and interact and exchange so you start to think about middleware you start to think about broker services so so you start foundationally thinking about uh, platforms and and then there are the rest of us who think about um uh a product or a service like you're building a product which has some functionality you have a target audience you have a customer who has a need and you're going and solving that so it's it's a specificity in its you know it's it's bounded in its context of what it's trying to solve um in that case you start uh you know your day one choices are probably infrastructure and compute you start at that but you don't really think about platform at that point because it's natural um to think about uh to, to build everything contained within itself like you just think okay i have a product and therefore all my data all my um behavior of what that product does will just be wrapped into a, a you know a, a single um a module or an application and i'm just going to run that um and that's perfectly fine because you don't want to force a platform conversation on the day one because at you know at this point you're still testing waters on the idea and the effectiveness of your product you're you you're still finding your customers or maybe you have some beta customers that you've started looking at and you're fine tuning your solution which is the actual value prop which means the core of your product itself hasn't shaped up so you don't need to worry about context because that's you know, it's too early, um, but then you start. You you suddenly get into a stage where you've tested your beta customers. There is you know money in the bank. You start to see that um, I need to expand either horizontally in terms of 
you know, functionality, or I want to give this to more number of people. So you then get into the good side of problem is how do I scale? And I think that's when you start thinking about problem. Um, that's when you start thinking about how do I build it as a platform? And I can touch upon what that means um, yeah. when we talk about that. Sure. Um, I, I take a, a slight horizontal look at uh, what is the platform uh, doing? Like when it comes to processes that are being automated or, uh, or engagements between the users at both ends being uh, developed. Uh, if at that fundamental level processes, good processes, bad processes, iterations, how does uh, a challenge appear to you in a very general setting? How do you approach it when it comes to objectives and goals? Yeah, so I think when we start, um, at the point where, uh, you know, when you start worrying about, you know, separation of core and context, as I talked about, is when you start to scale. So your objective is that what is the core product doing and what is the context it needs to do what it's doing. Meaning you have like what we call in tech, we call it as your business logic. That's the ultimate service that your product is providing. And that's fine. And then, then that keeps growing based on your you know, testing and feedback. Um, but then you have uh, you know, things like, I need this to be manageable. I need this to be secure. I need this to um, be persistent and reliable. So these are contexts that are around the product, which are not necessarily have anything to do with how valuable your product is, but they are required for you to run in a durable manner. So those are your, that's when you start to slice and say, I need to separate these two because if I mix them, then you are bearing down the, you know, from a, from a, a, a concern perspective, you're bearing down on the, uh, let's talk a little bit about the organization as well, right? You're bearing down the team to think about both aspects and that might not be the right way to go about it. So you might want to say, okay, I want to outsource some of the contexts uh, which when I say outsource, it's not to a different place, but you sort of start thinking about them differently. So these um, contexts can be started to build in a more durable way that's you know essentially to your scaling. So, and as you called out, what are the processes or what are the objectives that you go after is one of the key things is how do I scale? How do I extend it? How do I customize it? Um, maybe you want to go global, right? You start to go one one particular region and then you say i want to go global and then there is an automatic variability that starts to come into play so are you designed for that are you designed to go global very quickly um how can you build that kind of strategy that doesn't weigh your team down that every uh, everything is not just hard to write but everything is hard to manage so i think when your good problems of customer and scale start to happen to you I think you start realizing that um, there is more to the product than the than the core of it. I need to give it a stronger context. Mm, from a startup journey perspective, I think like there's a lot of things that kind of come back to haunt founders, like things that you wish that you had known earlier. So if you had to share with uh, young or early stage uh, uh, entrepreneurs, technical, non-technical, um, in terms of uh, certain logics or uh, like certain caveats mm -hmm. that you would uh, thumb rules or principles. So this, this particular insight is meant for entrepreneurs just starting up. How much should they try to learn or emulate from platforms or corporates or larger industry players? And how much should they try to figure it out as they go along? Um, I think every, definitely every, um... Uh, you know, uh, journey is unique in itself, but then you have enough design patterns or you have enough patterns in the industry to learn from. So your specific question was, how do you uh, make sure that, or, or what are the things that I should not miss? Um, what do you not want to miss is the, always think about how you, while you have your eye on the today, like today I need to run this by a good, investor i need to run this with these three beta customers is a today problem just envision what happens you know, what is a possibility three years from now um you know from from that perspective uh that's when you uh you because what seems most intuitive today which 
you know, fit everything together in a single bundle uh, without um, contracts or durability. Or, you know, the product doesn't integrate, it's not modular, it's all just clunky, but it's small, it's tiny um, because today you just started. Uh, this will hurt in the longer run because when you grow and scale, uh, if you have a bespoke implementation, um, you essentially will run into the problem of tribal knowledge, right? So the product grows in the tribal knowledge as opposed to separation through contracts. So which essentially means five engineers know what the product does and those five engineers are the only ones who can go and change things. And then those five engineers are needed when you have to scale it. So how do you not get into that mode of uh, building on uh, tribal knowledge versus durable contracts uh, then starts to hurt you because you can no longer manage it or extend it uh, without people. You essentially, um, uh, you will have to make it durable only as a separate effort. So don't write something to begin with as, as, as a piece that doesn't have that modularity. Um, start thinking, even if you're not building a big platform, try to make the code modular, try to make it integratable, but you know, don't fall for that. I'm building a generic thing. Don't do that. That doesn't, it's, it's like all the way to the you know, right or left, right? Don't, you need to stay somewhere in the center that don't need, you don't need to separate organizations. You don't need to separate teams. You don't need to create abstractions from the beginning but make sure that you're writing re reusable um, Lego foundation blocks that can be put together um, and removed. Uh, if, if your tech is focused on that, uh, then your tech can scale. Um, I think that's the one thing I would say. Perfect. Um, I, that actually helped me visualize the Lego reference is something that uh, I've heard tech entrepreneurs use a lot and thank you for sharing that. Um, in terms of mindset um, of the team that you had touched upon right now briefly that like uh, the culture of the organization also is a big, big component. So mm -hmm. would you like to expand a bit on that? Um, sure, I definitely. And I think this might, you know, to make it relatable to startups, right? Startups aren't large teams and um, I think startups are intimate small teams of people who are passionate about something and they're bringing something to life. And as you scale, or even if you grow that, the hardest thing, and I've been in many startups and I've also worked in big organizations, is to retain that intimacy. And how do you become a big organization who still has that trust and you know, equation with as a, as a small team is the hard one to do. And so when you start to think platforms, don't think about large teams with you know uh, friction and interdependencies right it, it just means that you have created modular and uh, durable contracts that people don't need to depend on people they just things work with with or without having interactions uh you know between the individuals on a normal basis so you can onboard new teams you can you can you know probably uh, bring in partners to do your work uh without having to you know spend months just onboarding them so that's essentially what it means by creating you know those building blocks it's not to separate that okay block a owned by x and y and c so don't it's not to create those don't create organizational boundaries um you can still have those blocks and you can still have autonomous teams uh, who are able to create products but at the same time um go for if these are uh uh, continuing the uh, analogy on Lego blocks, these are robust blocks that outside in, you know the shape, you know how it fits with another thing. And also make it make it so that someone else can come and contribute to it. So it's it's not just a black box, but it's a reasonably transparent to teams for, you know, to, to an extent to come and contribute to it. So that way teams are autonomous in and also empowered. So they can, uh, they can go about making changes to their individual blocks they can suggest changes and also make changes to other people's blocks and everybody knows how to put them together. So the mindset there is boundaryless uh, uh, and autonomy and empowerment. So if you, if you mix this, then you have sort of un, you know, unleashed your engineers on, 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 a, on a very you know, nurturing environment where 
they're not going to come and complain you know what i need these five api changes and you know i don't not getting it from this team or getting from that team because that's not what you want to vision like 10 years down the line that you know you have all these uh, teams who are fighting amongst themselves on uh, i am blocked and i'm dependent so while you're creating these uh, durable contracts and blocks make sure that uh, from the get go keep an open and boundaryless organization easier said than done but i think if the culture starts from the beginning it's much easier than infusing it later right so uh, i heard you say like in in more relatable terms the transparency of uh, your uh, task is something that is uh, quite vital and also where it comes to ownership of that it it's something that everyone is um, geared towards the organizational goal or the product goal so uh, in that way the invitation is for people to come and partake uh, at the designated task and also help in terms of being able to be nimble and and navigate if someone is caught up in a work stream heading in one direction then you have the ability to uh, keep moving forward that's um, that's very interesting insight so uh, thank you for sharing um if you if you had to go about building a platform uh, you also have to understand that like maybe somewhere the startup needs to pivot so in 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 those situations what are some of those i guess alarming situations that you do end up uh, finding yourself once in a while when organizational direction shifts uh, what are the conflicts that could be uh, something to look at uh, maybe early on maybe to Too early on. Yes, I think I think um, you know this is I would this is more this is agnostic of tech, and I guess that's uh, any kind of change that happens, and you know it it could be pivots in your idea, it could be pivots in team structure or how you work or you know what kind of culture you want to build. Or um, COVID. Right, uh, exactly. <laughs> so I think any change, right? I think the um, hardest thing for people to process um is the, is a change itself and um when people don't have and I, i have been through many transformations myself and i've been through different um, either reorgs or change in structures or culture and and pivots and ideas um one of these very very easy things to spot is when people are uncomfortable they would say there is no clarity um and and that's how it manifests as to so what you want to bring is clarity what you want to as a, as a, as a person who's leading um you know you, if you're if you're a startup uh, uh, founder and you're pivoting it's your responsibility uh, it's not consensus it's not to seek consensus it's not a community driven thing so, so don't get me wrong that you're seeking consensus from everybody as to what need need to do but you need to be able to directionally give why um and the what uh the how is people will figure it out they will help you figure it out but if you are able to give directionally why you're changing what you're changing and what is the broader vision towards which we're going then um teams rally behind you um even if they don't agree you know even if there is a disagreement and and commit more right you still will see that yeah that makes sense um and here's my reasoning right i think that transparency is important and it has to trickle down like i don't know how the size is but it cannot be obviously start and you radiate that to to larger groups of individuals uh, you start with your core team and then you 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 radiate to a broader organization but you need to take that time to communicate it and articulate it and and in those uh, discussions words matter right it's not about saying blah blah and then just moving on i think the words actually matter at that time because it needs to inspire confidence because uh, as 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 all of us know right it's a privilege to have people work with you um it's not that they need to work with you so how do you make sure that people continue to work with you uh is on the leader and i think the leader needs to take the accountability to make things clear and constantly seek feedback constantly seek feedback on clarity and purpose if these are you know if there, there is no clarity on purpose or uh or the why then you will start seeing people getting disengaged or you know you'll have 
um, uh, essentially you know, feedback saying, you know what, things are not clear and I don't know what we're supposed to do. So uh, generally, I think users signal with through feedback that these are certain changes or these are bugs or these are features that they'd like. Um, and and how do you um, how do you kind of um, like when it's a large product and there are like thousands of customers out there, um, do you make features based on your assumptions or do you ask enough feedback? How do you uh, take this as a as a as a tactic to move forward? So um, the, I guess there are like two, two we, we sort of do bottom up and top down um, kind of innovations. Um, uh, like, you know, we very famously said, if you ask somebody um, what they want, they will tell you, I want a foster horse. They will never say I want a car, right? So the, the big uh, uh, changes or makeovers are typically um, instincts or uh, inputs coming from, you know, probably less than 5% of your organization saying, I think there is a vision. I think, I think this is what customers want. And then you go and once there is a hypothesis uh, based on an industry trend or um, you know, an instinct based on the data that we are reading about the usage uh, that you go and say, okay, I think this is what I would want to go and solve. And once you put that out there, the process is straightforward. Then you essentially read beacons and you, you read signals, you experiment, you do you know, A-B testing, uh, you find control groups, you do beta customer testing. So you have different mechanics to understand what are people telling you? Is it an outright no, or it's a, you know, it, it, you, you go to your, obviously you will definitely go to your advisory board and play that against with them. And you also test groups and you also will put your betas. Uh, so thankfully with, with, with so much of sophistication in experimentation platforms, um, it's, it's quite easy for us to go and do this. And there are very proven patterns in terms of uh, you know data um, uh, analytics as well as uh, experimentation um, methodologies that allow us to all do the same that you know the, the, the Googles or the uh, uh, Facebooks do every day. So I think entrepreneurs have that. The second one is bottom up, uh, where you are putting your ear to the ground. You are listening to feedback, either uh, the voice of the customer through the product or through your email channels. Uh, you know, you, you need to give them an opportunity to say whatever they want to say, and then you have to keep listening to that, you know, and distilling out what is the theme that is coming out of it. Uh, there may be drip changes. Those are drip changes, but those are things that we didn't think of. They are deltas. You, you Once in a while, you'll find like an aha uh, from that, but you will always find drip changes through that particular stream. So with these two mechanics of of you know, uh, top down and bottom up, um, you, you reach a place where you're constantly listening to feedback, and at the same time, you're pushing some bold ideas to your customers. Sure. So um, as we are part of the series of uh, startup circles, and uh, this is an initiative between Head Start and Intuit Circles, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about Intuit supporting startups and uh, Intuit supporting other platforms. So um, if you could take it. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I think so. As as Intuit's mission is to uh, power prosperity, um, I think one of the things that uh, we uh, started to do was power prosperity for other for startups. You know, who better to do that than than for startups um, who are um, a, a very um, you know close to our heart because these are you know those who dare to dream. And, and, and create something for, for, for all of us. Um, and uh, what we have done is we have essentially do, done a, a free product-led uh, product growth community, uh, which essentially brings uh, the startup ecosystem and, uh, and the influencers uh, together uh, such that you can network and engage. So the, the idea there is uh, to start a conversation, to be able to um, connect directly with different influencers of the ecosystem. These can be their startup accelerators, um, incubators, investors, um, and, and also, you know, uh, like how you and I are talking now, essentially being able to create best practices uh, for, uh, for them, as well as um, being able to uh, collaborate 
uh, in terms of uh, uh, integrating their app with Quick QuickBooks um, as like a third party developer and, 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 and add value to the um, to the ecosystem of products that we sell to our customers. Um, and that's essentially the, 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 the vision. And uh, we have uh, over, um, I think, 2,500 startups who are signed up um, in this program. And um, uh, there is this is a very active community, uh, and we are we're constantly engaging with um, uh, with the with the uh, entrepreneurs, and, uh, and and also partnering with them to do integrations. We just had uh, the Open uh, founder. They uh, got acquired by Razorpay recently. And uh, they were mentioning about uh, it being, and he, it, 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 this was the founder of Opfin, and this is his words. He said, I would give the APIs an eight on 10 uh, in terms of its ease of being able to integrate with their startup. So uh, I, I don't know how picky or choosy he is with his numbers, but I think coming and uh, coming close to a perfect score is, uh, is, is a great, uh, great response from your community already. So, yeah, uh, that's very happy to to know. I think we usually focus a lot on how products look. Um, I think we uh, have started to now focus more on how APIs start to look because, you know, with business integrations, that becomes more critical. Right. So um, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk with us today. Thank on you, closing, much. on closing, if you have any last thoughts and. Um, no, I think um, I think this is a great initiative and, and really nice uh, speaking to you, Kiran, as well. And I hope this was useful. Um, and I and I, and I wish uh, all the uh, startup entrepreneurs entrepreneurs, um, uh, you know, this, this is a hard journey. Um, and I wish you all uh, not just luck, but the very best. And uh, and but it is a great adventure. And you're on a uh, you are on a very bold journey to realize, uh, you know, what very few of us try to do and more power to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.